So uh, maybe the title is a little misleading here. So I, I, I know on the, um, on the summit site, uh, we, we talked about, uh, there's a description or an abstract there in terms of talking about the provider's journey and really what this uh, talk is structured in is more sort of like a panel uh, type session. So I've got a few individuals up here with me and uh, we've got some questions uh, for them. And what it's going to sort of unravel is the, um, uh, the journey specifically with uh, MWA uh, and Apache Airflow. So to start it off, we're going to do some uh, really quick intros and then we'll dive right into it. Uh, so myself, uh, my name is Rajesh Pishendale. I am the SDM for the open source team uh, with the uh, MWA group. Uh, my name is Ashish. Uh, I am a senior engineer working for the MWA team. I've uh, been in Amazon for like six years and working for the MWA product ever since its inception. Um, I'm Kalhan, um, senior engineer with AWS. Uh, been with Amazon for about seven years uh, and with the team uh, MWAA for about four years. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel. I'm a senior SDE with uh, AWS. Um, I've been on the MWA team since launch with AWS for about eight years. Hey folks, yeah, also senior engineer at Amazon. Surprise, surprise. Uh, I work on the open source team. I used to work on the MWA team, helped build and launch that product, and uh, moved over to working on open source. All right, thanks guys, and uh, we'll jump into it. So where did it all start? In 2019, a bunch of really smart people tinkering around in a basement and uh, looking at uh, what Airflow was about to become, uh, came together and thought about, hey, you know, we have, uh, some customers that are using Airflow and they're self-hosting, working on the AWS environment. Um, how can we make their lives uh, a little bit better? And um, from there, uh, that idea sort of materialized. And in November of 2020, uh, MWA was finally launched, which is a, a provider for Apache Airflow. Uh, so uh, through a lot of like really ex like fast growth and um, uh, uh, an adoption of uh, MWA, uh, the team, you know, fairly young, fairly new in the process, uh, looked to sort of establish uh, stability and understand scalability to ensure that the service remained stable for the customers that were coming on board and obviously for the future as we move forward. And that ultimately resulted in maybe a lack of keeping up with, you know, current versions of Airflow uh, maybe not as many new features and being able to adopt new features that are going into uh, open source Airflow. Um, but then if we fast forward to, you know, 2021 and then from there, we've seen a lot more uh, feet, uh, version um, updates and version uh, parity. We have a lot of new features that have uh, been baked into Airflow and adoption from um, open source features as well too. And uh, we've seen a lot of changes within the service. And I think for the most part, you know, some customers are, or some users are, are very aware of what's going on versus some may not be, you know, completely aware of where NWA actually stands today. So, you know, in a, being over 30 plus regions, uh, launched in 30 plus regions uh, from AWS, it's, it's, a, it's fairly efficient and it's fairly large and there are a lot of new things that we'd sort of like to uh, break that uh, misconception of what uh, MWA is. So my first question that uh, I have here is uh, organizations that, uh, um, uh, that exist today that work with Airflow, they start small and they end up, you know, they end up growing and they become much larger and that requires uh, adoption for maybe higher compute or, you know, additional resources. What sort of, and this is a panel, I know it's kind of weird how I stand here, but what sort of accommodations has MWA done um, for these customers as they grow? Um, yeah, so um, for MWAA as of, um, as of today, we basically offer um, five sizes of environments. They are basically tagged as classes. So there are five classes of environments. We've got small, medium, large, um, extra large, and 2x large. For a mid-tier large-sized environment, you've got like four vCPUs with eight gigs each for RAM uh, for your schedulers and workers. 
And you know, as you go up in these classes, the number of vCPUs basically doubles and goes as high as 16. And the RAM per vCPU also, it essentially doubles from large to Excel and then uh, uh, so on and so forth for 2x. Uh, so what this does is um, it, it gives you more compute uh, to run your workloads. Uh, you know, for a large, you, you know, you could start with default of like 20 concurrent tasks, and then as you go up, it goes to 40 and 80. And with more concurrent, concurrency here, um, you can basically run more uh, larger number of DAGs. So from 1,000 DAGs in large to 2,000 in Excel, and then 4,000 in Excel, uh, 2x. Yeah, so with more compute, more concurrency, you know, more number of DAGs that you can run, it just gives you an ability to scale as your business grows and then run you know, heavier workloads. Thank you. Uh, so large environments, uh, bigger instances of work, uh, airflow, more DAGs, more compute, more everything. I think the next question that makes sense is, from a customer perspective, how do we handle scaling? So with uh, MWA, you uh, can have your uh, workers and web servers auto scale. So one thing interesting uh, that we can talk about is the worker auto scaling and the improvement that we've done recently. So before I can go into uh, what was improved, I need to basically explain the uh, problem. And so you can see in the diagram over here, uh, I have certain metrics being shown. So in case you, uh, you're not aware, MWA currently only supports Celery Executor. And uh, for uh, something which is working with a Celery Executor, your workload can be defined as a summation of the number of running and the number of queued tasks. So that's basically the work to be done. So over here, uh, you see uh, there's a spike in the number of queued tasks. And uh, some of the, this work gets picked up by uh, the existing workers. So you see some increase in the running number of tasks. But that pace may not be enough, so additional workers may need to be created, which is represented by red here. And uh, you will see some of these queued tasks going down and running tasks coming uh, up because there are more workers now. As time progresses, some of these running tasks may complete. And now you have a situation where you don't have any more queued tasks and the running tasks are also down. So you have less work to be done and that's why you need to have lesser workers. And you will see uh, some of them scaling down at T7 in the, uh, in the diagram. And when everything is done, you see every one of those additional workers uh, getting scaled down. But this is what was not happening uh, till recently. Till May 2024, this year, uh, we had a situation where when we need uh, to scale uh, in, then uh, we won't be able to do that unless uh, all of your running and queue tasks go all the way down to zero. So uh, it's kind of similar uh, to the pr previous graph where you were able to scale out as expected, but not scale in. So why was that? So there were a couple of challenges that we had to solve. Um, first of all, uh, we uh, make use of uh, Fargate as our compute provider. And uh, with AWS Fargate, uh, when you want to do uh, some scaling, Fargate picks a task at random. So you don't get to decide exactly which one of your tasks is going to be scaled in as part of auto scaling. Second, uh, when it is uh, the time to scale in any particular uh, Fargate task is what they call it. At random. Second, you, it only gives you two minutes to uh, gracefully complete everything, which is not enough for airport tasks. Third, um, e even when, um, let's say, you picked a worker which was idle by the time you started to scale in, there is a possibility that that particular worker may pick some of the airflow tasks from the queue uh, before it actually shut down everything. So there is a risk condition also involved. So these were the few challenges that we faced uh, when uh, we were launching the service. And uh, we struggled with a lot, like how we can make this better, but uh, uh, 
basically there wasn't any good solution out there which would uh, uh, be satisfactory for the customer. So that's why we had this problem for a couple of years. But that thing changed uh, when uh, Fargate uh, released uh, one, a particular feature called uh, uh, Update Task Protection. And basically we built on top of that and uh, also introduced uh, a uh, like fine-grained task monitoring, uh, which now is part of each and every worker which is out there within the, AW uh, within the MWA ecosystem. And uh, so we monitor all these uh, tasks and make use of uh, uh, the, one of the feature from, task, uh, from Fargate to basically take complete control on when we need to scale in any particular task. Uh, by the way, I task, I mean Fargate task. So by, by getting this complete control, we were able to solve all these challenges that we previously had. And now we are at a situation where our auto scaling basically works. Uh, and it works as shown in the, you know, the first diagram. So that's one of the newest improvements that were done for the uh, worker auto scaling. Yeah. Thanks, Ashish. So MWA provides a solution that uh, incorporates uh, vanilla air airflow. And it's not uh, a take-only type relationships relationship. So in what ways, um, you know, the does MWA or does uh, the organization or the team actually give back to the open source community? Hello, mm, there we go. Uh, okay, yeah, this is my favorite question. I'm the token open source person here. So uh, a lot of developers in the uh, Airflow community know this, but maybe not so much users, but uh, AWS has a whole team who develops on open source Airflow dedicated. Uh, there's about four or five of us. Uh, we have our own PMs, our own management, our own directives, our own goals. Um, so we're super focused on Airflow as a community. Uh, we work alongside the MWA folks and we collaborate, but, um, but yeah, we give back, you know, the time of five full-time uh, employees. Um, we develop, you know, big features, bug fixes. Uh, we focus a little bit on the AWS corner of Airflow or the provider package. You know, being from Amazon, we have some responsibility there. But also, that's not to discredit the open source work that the MWA folks do. The um, the local runner package, I don't know if any, anyone here has used that, but they've done a huge effort to open source that. Uh, so you can run almost exactly the image that uh, they're using on the back end, and that's super helpful for local dev testing. And they do very impressive, uh, you know, like bug deep dives. When they get a customer who has an issue, not always is that the MWA service. Sometimes that's an underlying open source thing, and, you know, they're pretty self-sufficient. They've done some impressive deep dives fixed logging, fixed salary, some bugs in Airflow itself. Um, you know, the open source team collaborates with them and helps review those PRs, but um, they've done some huge fixes in Airflow. That, uh, there's one out right now for salary, actually. Um, so yeah, super impressive stuff from both sides of the team. Awesome, thanks. The next question here is uh, wanting to dive into the, uh, the infrastructure solution that we actually provide. Um, it is, it is a little bit challenging at times, maybe when there's issues in order to troubleshoot issues. But one of the unique things in the way that uh, MWA has designed that infrastructure is that there's some boundaries. There's some boundaries because as a customer, you have your own set of responsibilities and your own uh, IP for what you work with and, and your data and your DAGs. And then there's obviously the infrastructure side where you know, this team here helps take care, uh, take care of. How, can, can we talk a little bit more about, you know, what that is and why that actually exists? Yeah, um, one of the things that I'm, uh, I think is interesting is that when dealing with customers, um, I've noticed that they're, um, during support, they're often su surprised that the things that we aren't, we don't have visible, basically. Um, so if you think about the airflow runtime, your, your logs, your metrics, um, those aren't available to us by, uh, by design, we basically push those directly to your account so that we cannot see them because those represent your data in the same way that your DAGs, you know, we sync them, but they don't persist inside our system. Um, so I think that, you know, that has resulted in a shared responsibility model uh, where, you know, if your code, um, your DAGs, uh, you need to, um, you manage that with our, with our help. But, um, you know, the the upside is that it has maintained a high data, um, data bar and it has resulted in us 
getting compliances with uh, HIPAA and uh, SOC 2 and, and a whole a bunch of those. So, um, I, you know, it, it really has been designed to protect your data first. Um, and, you know, us as a managed service, that's a, a, you know, the inconvenience of not being able to see that is, is a secondary, basically. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I'm going to try and speed up through the next few questions just so that we can get through them all. So now that we understand why those boundaries exist, I think the next logical thing is talking about if we're troubleshooting or we're managing metrics, how is that actually done today with MWA? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. I think um, with troubleshooting and debugging, um, you know, two things. As debugging 101, you need logs and you need metrics. Um, for a MWAA environment, we, for each Airflow component, we push logs to CloudWatch. So for example, you've got logs for your scheduler, your worker, uh, your web server. Um, and one of the nice things of pushing them to CloudWatch is that um, there's something called a metric uh, filter in CloudWatch where you can basically identify a pattern and create log-based metrics. So say you have something like an exception that shows up or a warning that appears, uh, you can create metrics on that. Um, we also offer uh, metrics uh, for the underlying compute where the uh, you know where your workload runs. For example, we've got metrics on uh, you know the memory of the compute, the CPU utilization. Similarly, for the database, we have metrics on the number of database connections it has, and then you know we've got metrics for uh, the web server's load balancer, the number of you know active connections, and similarly for the queues, we've got metrics on you know how many tasks are queued, how many tasks are running. And then you've got metrics in general, which Airflow emits, you know, parse times, uh, uh, you know, processor timeouts, task instance failures. So you, if you look at all of this together and if you put all of them together and say, you know, given these are on CloudWatch, uh, you can build a CloudWatch dashboard, uh, term it like a health dashboard for your environment. So, Say you put all of this together in a dashboard. Now, assume a deployment. Uh, you make a change. The change flows through your CI/CD pipeline. Um, you update uh, your MWA environment, and then you know you look at your dashboard, and the metrics you know start going haywire. That is an indication that something changed. Uh, either it changed as part of the deployment, or say you were you know the upstream data that you were pulling from. Uh, you know there's more data all of a sudden because there is a peak, right? Uh, so you will see spikes in your CPU, in your memory. Um, so they, they, these metrics kind of give you an indication that something has happened. Uh, and not only that, uh, say over a period of time, um, you know, you've got log-based metrics, and you see a, a warning show up once or twice, which is an indication of you know, a code smell. It might not be a bug, but it could certainly indicate that something is not entirely right. And you see that over a period of time, um, uh, there is a increase in a trend of uh, this exception, um, and then it just keeps on going up. So, you know, these dashboards and these metrics together give you an overall picture of how your environment is um, and what was the historical nature of this environment. And this information together uh, will help you debug um, problems. So, so these are dashboards that, you know, users can create for themselves in their own environment. So if we're troubleshooting issues with uh, the engineering team, for example, how does that work? Can we share that information? Uh, of course. Um, we, as part of MWAA, have internal logs, internal metrics, um, and it is certainly useful to kind of, you know, uh, see the metrics on the customer side in their dashboards and, you know, kind of uh, work together and force multiply, uh, you know, our strengths and, you know, metrics on both sides to kind of, uh, you know, double down on problems. So it certainly helps if customers have these dashboards pre-built uh, for us to review when, you know, we are troubleshooting with them. Okay, that's pretty cool. My next question here uh, probably uh, stems from, you know, where MWA started and the team really kind of, you know, after launching, you know, pretty much stayed on one version for uh, quite a bit of time and then trying to figure out what's the best way to keep up with uh, Airflow as Airflow has these, you know, um, fairly uh, frequent release cycles. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit to, you know, where MWA is today in terms of versioning and being able to be on parity with, you know, Airflow as Airflow progresses. Yeah, so um, way back when we launched, we started on uh, Airflow 1.10. Um, we were there for quite some time. Um, with the launch of Airflow 2.0, we launched our second version support. 
Um, but back in those days, we were uh, fairly slow about launching new versions. Um, we've done a lot of process improvement to um, accelerate our uh, version launches. We're now at a point where we um, launch every minor version, um, and we we target about four to six weeks after launch um, from the open source side to uh, to add our support. Um, with caveat being always, there's new features that may or may not take longer or shorter. Uh, so we, but that four to six weeks is our target. Um, and then, as Nico alluded to earlier, with the 2.9 launch, we open sourced our base image, um, which is basically the uh, image our developers work on, um, and then we we sync into our pipeline. So um, it has um, it was part of just improving our development experience so that we could launch versions faster. But I think that it has the uh, added effect that um, for MWA users, you can test new versions, to, um, run local development environment for your DAGs, um, test between uh, version moves, which is you know an important part of maintaining a, um, an airflow instance. So. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then speaking of new versions, I'm sure a lot of you have heard a lot of chatter about Airflow 3. Uh, there's going to be um, a, a keynote in the panel uh, tomorrow regarding Airflow 3, but you know, Maybe we can provide some insight today in terms of you know what is MWA and the open source team actually driving for Airflow three. Yeah, so the open source team has been engaged right from the beginning. You know, we're monitoring the community, so uh, right from scoping and project planning, um, reviewing AAPs, writing AAPs. Um, some of the features we're going to be focused on is um, multi-team or multi-tenancy. Most people probably know it as. Uh, that's something we've heard from users and customers for years that they want. Uh, and we really want that to land for Airflow 3, so we're going to help out there. That'll probably involve writing some new auth managers, uh, especially with FAB being removed from Airflow. Um, we're going to be writing uh, some uh, new config. Airflow configuration needs to be changed a little bit, so it's compatible with multi-team. We'll probably work on that. Um, we have some new APs coming that'll land in 3. We have uh, event-driven scheduling. So you'll be able to schedule DAGs with real events um, external to your Airflow environment. Um, that'll be big. Uh, SLA, I think we're going to try to fix that. I think a lot of people who use Airflow know that the SLA feature has never quite behaved the way you might expect it would. So we hope to deprecate the old version of that and deploy a really nice version of SLA in uh, Airflow 3. Um, so yeah, that's just a snippet. All of us are going to be focused on it for, uh, for the next few months here. It should be pretty cool. And, and you'll hear a, a bit more uh, in tomorrow's keynote. Yeah. So last last question. Thanks, Nico. Uh, last question. Other than uh, the booth in the back of the ballroom, uh, how do you how do we get a hold of the team if we got new ideas, new feature requests, or issues, for example? You know, how do we get a hold of you guys? Right. Um, so in order to reach out to the MWA team, the, I guess the most efficient way would be to reach out to the AWS support. And through that, you uh, get a team of uh, support engineers uh, behind that issue that you just reported. And in case uh, there is further expertise required, the MWA team is also available. So, uh, but uh, it, the right channels are better to follow uh, to get uh, those things looked at in a more uh, reasonable manner. So um, apart from that, uh, I believe the open source team is also uh, uh, heavily invested in uh, taking a uh, look at issues that people report on uh, Airflow uh, Slack channels. Um, and they're, uh, you know, always uh, uh, message away. Is there anything you may want to add? Nico? Yeah, I think that the Slack channel is a good place to get a hold of us, but I think GitHub is maybe even a little better. Cut, cut issues, discussions. We're trying to keep an eye on GitHub. It's a lot of contributors and a lot of code and issues being cut there, and we try to keep broad eyes across all of it, but like I said before, specifically if you have an AWS provider package issue, we watch that very carefully and we have some scripting and tooling around there. So if you cut an issue and tag it with the AWS uh, provider package, we'll, we'll see it um, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Yeah, that pretty much takes us to the end.